welcome to America at its best. My name is Rebecca Painter and I'll be your host for today's show. I'm so glad that you guys are here with us today. The whole reason we have this show is so that you can tune in every once in a while just to see the impact that your partnership with SPN and this network is making on the country today. So thanks so much for being here. We have a real treat in store for you. So when I used to visit y'all before the pandemic hit and, and the conversations we've had since, we always circle back to the subject of young people. And there's a really big fear amongst us that young people are really leaning towards socialist values and views. In fact, a few of you guys were probably on the show a few weeks ago when Nick Gillespie with Reason was here. And he reminded us that one's worldview is often shaped by major life events that happen when they're young. I mean, think about your life. Now, depending how old you are or young, you know, World War II, Vietnam, the Berlin Wall coming down, the 60s. For some of you who were younger, maybe it was 9-11. Think about how those events shape your perspective today. Young people right now are facing pandemic on one hand and protests that are sometimes very violent, sometimes peaceful on the other hand, and trying to make sense of all this in the role of government. Their worldview is being shaped as we speak. I want to take a minute just to acknowledge some exceptional organizations who are out there, like the Bill of Rights Institute and the Jack Miller Center, who are making sure that young people are exposed to and, and understand and, and embrace the principles of our founders. Today, we are going to hear from our friends at the Foundation for Economic Education. You guys probably know him as Z, the president of the organization, and also David Bowes with the Washington Policy Center who are going to share with us how they are getting the idea of liberty in the hearts and minds and hands of young people today. But first, let's move over to my left here to Tracy Sharp and uh, just say hello. And, and Tracy, I know you are especially excited about today's show. Tell us why. Well, one thing we do here at SPN and we do it really well over the years and it makes a huge difference is we grow leaders. And I'm excited for today's episode because my personal leadership growth is thanks to the two organizations on our show today. My initial uh, aha moment of understanding the power of classical liberal ideas hit me at a fee conference I attended after I graduated from college. Wow. And at the time I was working at the Washington Policy Center. So this connection point for the ideas that uh, solidified my passion for this cause uh, were at that time and here I am a couple decades later uh, seeing how all these organizations have grown in their reach and effectiveness. Yeah Tracy now that you mention it I too was influenced a lot by the Foundation for Economic Education when I first started working at a think tank a long long time ago the first thing they did was send me out to Larry Reed uh, who at the time was just with fee. And that was my turnkey moment where he turned it on and it's, it's been there and alive ever since. So that's, yeah, this is a very special day for us. Now tell us a little bit more about state policy networks, outreach and programs that have to do with young people. Oh, sure. We have several programs. I'll, I'll give three quick examples. Uh, we do what's called an internet program, which is provides online resources to the dozens of interns who are out in, among the state think tanks. Uh, secondly, we have a long time program called the Generation Liberty Fellows that it's a very competitive application process for 50 slots to be able to attend our annual meeting and get special programming. We have about 600 alumni from that program that we stay connected with. And, and then finally, uh, one of our more popular programs is our Development Apprenticeship Program. Again, it's a competitive application process for top young talent to get professional fundraising training. There is a demand for first class professionally trained fundraisers and hardly anyone is developing these leaders in the network. So we saw a need, we addressed the need, we pivoted to address this need. And now most of those trained graduates of this program go directly to working full time in the network. That's great, thank you, Tracy. All right, let's hear from our first guest. And as we're talking, please, a quick reminder, use the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen, ask questions at any point, and we will do our best to get to them by the end. 
So Z is joining us today from the Foundation for Economic Education. Z, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me and thank you for all the nice words you have to say about fee. Oh, I love fee. So for those who aren't as familiar with fee, tell us what it is you guys are all about. Well, on one hand, we are 75 years old, so my punchline is we lasted longer than Soviet Union, so wait for that. <laughs> uh, what we're doing right now, what we have been doing for the past eight years, is reaching young people. Our goal is to reach at least 10% of the current young generation, so we need, we need to reach 4 million people to convert them to liberty, and that's how we get uh, the rest of the generation on board. Right now, we have about 1 million per week, so we need to grow, but we're on a really good path. Great. Now, how are you reaching these younger generations with this idea of freedom? Well, the joke around the office is that young people do three things during the day. It's uh, sleep, uh, on, uh, be online, and go to classes. And I'm happy to report we cover two-thirds of the daily activities. Uh, our online activities is everything from social media to YouTube. They explore subjects that young people care about. They explore subjects like the economics of the Avengers universe, and they basically catch them on the things that young people care about and bring them little by little to our side. So that's our online programs. Our in-person programs, we send uh, peace professors, we send faculty, we, co we cooperate with groups like IHS and multiple mm -hmm. others, but we basically, we take college professors, we put them in public schools, they do an excellent five hour long workshop uh, with teachers, with students, and once again, they explain why the government is not the answer to all of life's problems. So between these two programs, like I said, it's about 1 million weekly conversations with folks. So help me understand, my niece graduated from high school. She was looking at colleges one day, the next day she was getting paid by TikTok. I can't keep up with how quickly they move and pivot. You've mentioned in classroom training, well, there are no classes now. How have you guys pivoted to keep up with them? Right, so in the first two weeks, we developed our online learning center, which is resources for educators. So let's say, imagine you're a homeschooler, which is now, which have to school kids, we have resources for you. If you're a teacher and now have to teach economics or civics online, we have resources for you. So that was one pivot. Another pivot was we just moved some of our classrooms online and turned them into webinars. So once again, great attendance. I think two weeks ago, we had a record week of 2,300 students and teachers in one week actually listening to what we have to say. So I think we've been very fast in pivoting and we're very well prepared for the fall and the upcoming disruptions. Good. So tell me, you guys have done a, a big research project uh, that you finished up recently. What did you find about young people's attitudes around liberty? I mean, do they even care about liberty? Mm -hmm. Right, so that's a three year long, $2 million project, uh, audience research project sponsored by John, uh, John Templeton Foundation. I, I would say, yes, they care about liberty. Uh, all is not lost, you know, no need to run for the woods yet. Uh, then we look at people's affiliations. More people identify as conservative and libertarian than they do as socialist or communist. So that's, that's good. So I think the key message would be young people do care about the same things we do, but when always, when they're not always as consistent, so we need to sort of talk to the things they care about. And second, we as conservatives or we as libertarians, we are awful at talking to young people. We approach them with language they do not understand. We approach yeah, them with Can you give me an example? Uh, we test, for example, we tested a couple of slogans. So we tested, uh, don't hurt other people, don't take their stuff. Uh, more than half of the people, of young people, regardless of whether in college or high school, agree with this kind of statement. They say, great, they're libertarian. Uh, then we, another slogan we tested was taxation is theft. Now, I do agree that taxation is theft. 8% of young people agree with that. My oh, it's so catchy. <laughs> I know, right? So my point is, don't talk to them about things that they do not understand yet, but reach out to their, where they are. Now, I'm not saying, switch your message. I'm not saying stop talking about liberty. I'm not saying become like a centrist or a leftist. I'm saying be really mindful of what your audience knows, be really mindful of what they have experienced, and approach them through there. In that, in that sort of way, liberty has a chance. What else really surprised you from this study? Uh, People hold inconsistent views, especially young people. Uh, and they can, be so, they can be agreeing that taxes are too high in one sentence, and the next sentence they would be also agreeing that uh, everyone needs universal health care. It doesn't matter how much it costs. So once again, I think we need to realize this. We as professionals in our everyday work, we're very far removed from regular people, and especially young people. And now I don't, see, don't say it in any kind of demeaning manner, but the concepts we kind of deal with are very far removed from everyday work. 
so people do hold inconsistent views. So rather than ridiculing them for being inconsistent, I think we should grab onto the things that unite us. So you know, government spending is too large and sort of bring them uh, to our side. That I think is the approach. If you, um, if you point out to people that they're being inconsistent or just don't know things, uh, that's a way to know it. It seems like a lot of young people, at least that I talk to, care a great deal about the environment, right? So when I want to talk to them about the economy, they want to talk about the environment. What do you do about that? Well, we do have series, we have, uh, we have YouTube episodes, we have articles about environment, once again, and it's a challenge for all of our movement. What's a libertarian, what's a conservative way to answer environmental concerns? I think we do have answers. My point is, I think, for for, for quite long, we've been, we've been dismissing them as irrelevant. And in that case, we sort of, we ceded the ground to the lefties. I mean, there are many people in environmental movement which are upset with leftist takeover. I mean, there's a famous case of the ex-head of the Greenpeace being upset with politicos or the lefties taking the, over the green movement. So I think once again, if we're looking at the, at the sort of a long-term game, we need to have answers for problems that young people care about if we want young people to care about what we have to say. Someone mentioned to me that you guys had a story about how Rockefeller saved the whales that you're using to get young people to understand the way you think about the environment. Can you share that with folks? Well, that's a very well-known story. Uh, whale oil is obviously was very, very good commodity because it burned very clean. And that's, that's, that sparked people to build more ships and go and hunt whales. And uh, whales were hunted near to extinction, extinction until Rockefeller decided that if you refine oil, you get this synthetic whale oil, and that's how they used to refer to it, which burns even better and is much cheaper. And in fact, if you watch a Hollywood movie called The Heart of the Sea, which is basically a prequel to Moby Dick, uh, the, it's about hunting whales. In the end, the, the character says, says, you know what? Now they're getting whale oil out of the ground. And the point is, once again, we need to show that it is the human mind that creates solutions to any of the problems that we have. So do you feel there's hope for the future? Oh, absolutely. Now, being from Eastern Europe, uh, sure I carry my sort of share of pessimism. I think it's going to be a long fight. The sort of the, 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 the environment has definitely shifted. There are def the leftist ideas are definitely more prevalent than were 10 or 15 years ago. My point is we haven't lost yet. Just because there are uh, crowds on the streets uh, chanting leftist slogans doesn't mean that all young people are. I think exactly the wrong kind of tactics would be to distance ourselves from young people, to say that they're lost generation and it's up to us old people to save them. No, I think we need to engage them. I think we need to be proactive, aggressive, really work on it, then we have a chance. If we just hope for them turning to our side, that will not happen. It seems like every generation that's passed is concerned about the next generation coming up and how, how far left they, they seem to be. Is this is today really much different than, you know, than it was 50 years ago? Well, I do one better and say that's the same as it was two millennia ago. You can find ancient Roman writings about <laughs> parents and grandparents complaining about their children and grandchildren, seeing they're unworthy. There's famous cases from Middle Ages where their parents do not want to leave their land to the children because they think they're unworthy. So I think on one hand, yes, it is it's just old people complaining about young people. At the same time, I am concerned with the spread of the leftist ideas. I'm all optimistic, but let's not kid ourselves. Uh, compare young people to 20 years ago, leftist is definitely more in vogue. We have uh, Teen Vogue writing about socialism. Uh, we have all these, we have educational institutions, we have media institutions, we basically banned the left message. So the fight, the environment is much more difficult right now. But once again, I think we stand a chance if we really do our due diligence, do research, and do work. One of the things we did at V, we said, from now on, we're gonna be not a feelings-driven organization, but a data-driven organization. Uh -huh. So how we approach young people is gonna be dictated by data and not how we feel about young people. So it's dictated by data, but you and I both know young people are influenced by music, movies, all their friends. So how are you infiltrating that world? Well, that's a big world to infiltrate, but let's say our YouTube channel is doing that. Well, okay. our most popular videos get about uh, two, million, 2 million views per video, which I think is great. And I think, once again, we take what pop culture is producing, we take the things that young people care about, and we turn it to our side. If one looks carefully, there is economics and story of liberty in pretty much everything that we do. So rather than saying, we shall create an alternative Hollywood, and that's how we take over young generation, that will never happen. Instead, 
we kind of work with what is. We work with existing pop culture. We work with existing educational networks. We tap into them like a virus, if you pardon my pun. <laughs> but I think that's, that's the way to change the young generation. Not to retreat and try to create alternative reality or wishful thinking, mm -hmm. but actually work with the situation, even if it is difficult. Z, last question. What do you see as the path forward and how can we all help to make a difference? Path forward, I think, is uh, I can sort of cite our, our biggest uh, finding of that 2 million research project. Our message is good, the way we deliver is bad. Mm -hmm. So don't sacrifice liberty, don't turn centrist or leftist, just think about how you're talking to young people and how you're presenting liberty. N liberty should be not something, not a relic of a bygone era, not something that lamented past, it has to be something compelling, something exciting. You know, liberty not just works, but we, of course we know it does, but liberty is the best way for different people to live together peacefully. I think that's the way forward. Yeah, Rebecca, I, I just want to lift up uh, Z and the work that Fee has done. They were early adopters in using digital channels and methods to spread more of these ideas and meet the youth where they're at. And this was a great example for us at SPN and for the rest of the network that we would look, we'd look and see what Fee was doing. And then we'd you know, pass along those examples to help grow the network faster in this area. So, and you know, I, I'm chuckling that the phrase taxation is theft doesn't work uh, with a lot of young people because they don't pay taxes, right? They don't quite understand that. Yeah, okay, well, <laughs> it's good to know. <laughs> Well, let me add one thing. If you want to read about that research and how we did that, it's available in fee.org slash year, year like, you know, a year that has gone by. Go there. It's 168 pages of practical advice, insights. And if you want to learn more, always contact us. We are happy to share that with our partners. We're happy to share that with SPN groups. You know, we're all in the same fight here, guys. So, you know, we are happy to share that resource. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, Z. Okay, we will hear from Z again during the Q&A at the end of the show, so please keep your questions coming in the, in the Q&A box. Next, we have David Bose, who's the Communications Director of the Washington Policy Center. David, welcome to the show. We're so glad you're here with us today. Oh, your mute's on, David. There you go. <laughs> yeah, as, as soon as he was over, I cut out and I thought, well, that's timing for everything. You know, it said rejoining, rejoining. Oh, um, well it's all good. You're here now. Now, yeah. you're coming to us from Washington. I've been seeing some really disturbing stuff about Seattle on the news. I mean, it, it is just under attack. So I guess my first question for you is how did the Washington Policy Center get to a point, considering everything that's going on in your state, especially in Seattle, where you guys said, you know what, we've, we've got to do something about young people. Well, yeah, it, it turns out, you know, um, Z and I have a lot in common. He's from Eastern Europe. I'm from Seattle. You know, we have a <laughs> statue of we have a statue of Lenin. I'm sure he's seen such such statues. Um, I would like the to statue's correct. Statue's actually still standing, though, right? Yeah, ours is still standing. You know, so so we're ahead of him there um, or behind, uh, depending on your perspective. Um, I think of his approach more like a vaccine than a virus, um, and I think Washington Policy Center has kind of adopted that that idea as well, which is, you know, the. Uh, the first thing was, um, and we see this time and time again, donors care about young people. And they, they have, you talk to any major donor, and this has been throughout my career in, in radio, which is what, where, where I started. Well, actually, I started with a think tank with Bob Williams, and then I ended up in radio. And, and, and so I have an SBN connection as well. But, but when you talk to people who are donating to the causes of liberty, they're not doing it for themselves because they're usually already successful. They've achieved their dreams. They're doing it for future generations. They want, they want to pass this on to young people. And you're not going to pass it on to young people if you're not actually talking to young people and doing things with young people. And that is time and again uh, how Washington Policy Center approaches this. It's a huge priority with donors. So we created a young professionals program specifically to keep young people in the fold, to bring more young people in, and uh, to remind ourselves that it's the next generation that counts. Yes, well, you're completely right. And that's why we've got some of our best supporters tuning into the show today, because we know they care about it too. So um, tell us more specifically, how are you reaching these folks? 
Well, first, uh, we have a young professionals program, as I alluded to, that targets uh, people under 40. And it really has uh, two components. There's the general young professionals, uh, which are, you know, post college, but we also have college campus clubs in five different uh, campuses around the, the state, including the University of Washington and Washington State University and so forth, and Gonzaga. Um, and then we host, uh, in fact, last year, the debate series was uh, co sponsored by fee uh, debate series to bring more young people in to expose them to free market ideas on campuses. Uh, we after one of our events, uh, or actually after multiple events, we surveyed the audience, but one in particular really stuck out with me because about 83% of, of the college students who attended one of our debates surveyed said they'd never heard the free market approach on campus before. 83%? You know, 83% of the, those attending. And, you know, as someone who I started at a state school, at Western Washington University, and um, I was just stunned at, at the leftist approach that I was getting. I knew what was wrong. I didn't know where to go to get the answers, to have the uh, intellectual ammunition to fire back. Um, and ultimately, I ended up finding Hillsdale College. But, yeah. but the response there didn't surprise me, really. It was just that the 83% just stuck out. I couldn't believe it was, it's still going on, where if you don't know what questions to ask or where to go for information or where to go for the truth, if you've never been exposed to another perspective, well, we shouldn't be surprised that they're kind of stuck in this mindset that is, you know, it's one degree of government or another. They absolutely have to be exposed to these other ideas. And so we have our college campus clubs, and then we have our young professionals clubs, which are heavily focused on getting young professionals to be able to network together uh, through events like our summer socials, uh, like our, our winter uh, socials, all those kinds of things to get them to hear free market perspectives and then interact with each other and, uh, and older white, uh, uh, WPC members. And so meanwhile, you've also had to pivot because in-person stuff is just not happening right now. So <laughs> how have you changed strategy? I was speaking with our young professionals coordinator about that uh, very recently, you know, and I asked, I said, you know, we've talked before, the, the key to, um, to engagement with young people for you has been events. So, you know, with COVID, how are you coping with that? And she, she just said, hey, creatively. Um, you know, the, the first thing was they started doing virtual events, you know, I mean, the virtual events seem to be kind of magic for some people. And, you know, we all got better at Zoom calls and we got better at uh, webcams and the rest. For most of these young people, they were already on board with that. But they also started getting bored with it because they, they want to actually have face-to-face -face interaction. So uh, one of the things that, that our young professionals um, have been doing is thinking outside the box. We had a, an environmental event, which was a big hike where they were able to separate and, and spread out among picnic tables, have that okay. social distancing, be able to do that. And then they also have um, an event coming up this Thursday where um, the YP board members are hosting people at their homes so they can have these small groups linked by the internet, but you're also having the face-to-face -face contact with these, these smaller you know, modules, if you will, that are able to, to offer that face-to-face -face human interaction and fun. Um, so, you know, they were very excited about that. So, you know, leave it to the kids uh, or, you know, sp speaking of <laughs> kids under 30, um, you know, they're, they're finding their way, finding a way to, to keep those events going. Good. That's really great to hear. Now, we heard Z say some crazy talk about how people, young people don't respond to things like, to phrases like taxation is theft. Meanwhile, you guys started a program called Free Market Destroys that they do respond to. So tell us about this Free Market Destroys that seems to go against the grain here. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, when, when Z was talking, I, that, that was really resonating with me because our project started out as a Free Markets Create program because we wanted to show people the benefits of the free market, particularly the young people targeting those 18 to 34. And we thought, you know, we really got to tell them what the markets create, all the benefits that they do and give them this alternative socialism. Well, then uh, we got together with Emergent Order, the creative uh, geniuses out there in, in Austin uh, and did some market testing. And it turns out, you know, that's a big snooze fest uh, for young people. It, it wasn't engaging them, wasn't, wasn't grabbing their attention. Uh, young people by temperament, uh, not necessarily ideology, but by temperament are progressive, right? Uh, they're revolutionary in thought. They want things right now and they want to tear down what's bad. And so they, they thought, well, what if we just approached it with free markets destroy and, and use that as the hook? And, and that worked. I mean, that, that had the lift. That was what was driving attention. They're like, Dest it destroys what? 
and then we, so, you know, today, uh, well, last week we launched this billboard campaign to kind of tease it around and get some social media buzz. And we had pictures of them all over our social media pages of free markets destroy, you know, um, things like boredom, um, poverty, uh, disease, hunger, um, you know, climate change to try and drive that conversation onto our, uh, our page, freemarketsdestroy.com, uh, get them signed up for uh, our, our blog and newsletter um, th that it's written in a different way. I mean, once again, this is absolutely right. Policy people tend to speak in policy language. In fact, the word policy should probably never be communicated to people under the age of 35 if True. you want them to actually hear what you have to say. So we're, we're focused on bringing uh, more young people in by showing them the power of the markets in a more creative way, starting with the destructive power of the markets. Thanks, David. All right, last question. Uh, you, you we're talking about young people. Can, can you just share a story from a young person that's been, you know, interacting with your organization, just anything that sticks out in life that maybe you've changed? Yeah, um, you know, we ha have uh, one YP board member, Amrick, who came here from France. He went to the University of Washington. He, um, uh, he got involved with the YP program on campus there. Uh, he ended up becoming a board member ultimately of, of YP. He speaks uh, at our events, very powerful force for freedom, talking about the opportunities that he gets here that he couldn't get anywhere else. Um, you know, his, his journey here has been incredible and inspiring. Um, our YP scholarship program for a local charter school uh, brought forward a student uh, named Nadalo. Uh, in our interview with her for a scholarship program, she talked about her uh, experience in interacting with YP, how it brought her to uh, respect other ideas and uh, have uh, left her more open uh, to hearing what other people have to say. Um, and she was really excited to go off into college with that new mindset you know, the, the, that you just can't put a price on that. We need, um, we need that replicated by millions. Um, and that's what we're out to do. Thank you, David. Okay, David, we'll be back shortly for the Q&A section. That's, thanks for your great work. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about young people and I thought it might be a fun surprise for you guys to actually get to hear from one of these young people that have been through these programs. So I just quickly want to introduce you to Grace Fendrick. Grace is now uh, working in Georgia at the Georgia Center for Opportunity. That's the think tank in Georgia doing incredible work. And Grace has actually been through our development apprentice program that Tracy talked about raising up leaders uh, in this movement. And so Grace, hi, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Grace just moved to Georgia two weeks ago and because there's the pandemic, she doesn't have any ways to meet people. So now she can connect with folks through these programs we just heard about today, at least virtually yeah. for a little while. But Grace, can you just tell the folks listening, especially because I know some of you tuning in right now have helped fund these programs specifically. And, and I, want, I want to thank you for that. And also just let you hear from Grace. You know, what was this like for you and how did it change your life going through this program? So the Development Apprentice Program was one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Um, I was going into my uh, senior year of college. I was approaching the summer before that, and I didn't know what I was going to do when I graduated. I was a political science major. I knew I cared about freedom, as my family had always instilled that in me. Um, but like a really key part that motivated me during that was uh, one year I was on campus and I was chalking so we were writing chalk messages on campus and we were stopped by campus police and they told us that we were vandalizing and that they were going to charge us with vandalism even though there were so many other campus organizations that did the same that did the same thing and they didn't do anything about it ultimately the police the campus police they we were like we know you're just doing your job like whatever they gave us a warning but then like two weeks later my friend and i get emails and we get brought and we basically get coerced into going to the dean of students office and we both get lectured by this college administrator who ironically had a poster of the first amendment behind him in the shape of an american flag lecturing me about how i'm not allowed to chalk on campus even though they let everyone else all these other campus orgs and other people that they do agree with do those things. And it was that experience that really made me passionate about the Liberty Movement and about spreading those ideas. And th so that was what led me to get more involved with uh, more campus-based organizations. And that was what led me to the Development Apprentice Program. And after going to the Development Apprentice Program, I realized that I can actually make, I can do something that I love 
while making the world a better place and promoting the ideals of freedom and free markets for everyone. And it can be a career for me. And so fast forward to the end of the summer, I had an amazing experience with the Georgia Center for Opportunity and they offered me a part-time job when I went back to Charlotte. Um, I was working remotely while I finished up my senior year. And then two weeks, I had already, two weeks into the pandemic, I was like halfway through my semester. I, you know, wasn't gonna have a graduation. I, I was also like, the economy's crashed. Like, I don't know what's gonna happen, but they still were able to offer me the full-time job we had been talking about. And I'm so, so blessed to have been able to do that. And it would not have been possible without the Development Apprentice Program and everyone that helped with that um, and made that possible funding that. And it helped so many people. I know so many of the other people in my cohort also are now working in development roles across the country for the freedom movement. Great, Grace, that's awesome. Thank you for everything you do and for being a leader amongst your peers. That's awesome. Thank you guys, thank you so much. Okay, now let's uh, move on into the Q&A portion of our show, which is always a good time. We'll bring our, our guests back up on the screen. There they are. Okay, the first question is from Peter Sprung, and I'd like to direct this uh, towards David and Z at first. And Grace, you might uh, you might actually have better answers just given your age. So please do jump in if you've got one. Peter wants to know how do we effectively use social media? As you say, as you guys all say, right? We have to meet young Americans where they are and where they hang out virtually. But how can we be better at this? You guys talked about this a little bit when I was talking with you, but let's dig a bit deeper. Uh, and also, if you could leave our viewers with you know, maybe things they could do a little differently moving forward. Well, if I may jump in, well, first thing I would say is use social media. Social media is a huge torrent of, uh, of content. So if you, let's say, if you post once per week, not even once per day, that's probably not enough. So you know, post about things, talk about things that people care about. I would say less is more think through what you want to post and uh, really select less words. Less words are definitely work better in this uh, uh, environment with people with short attention spans. Pictures, moving pictures, videos, all of these things uh, definitely do wonders. I can share one success story, one of our programs. Uh, uh, it's called Revolution of One. It, it's intended and it's, 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 it talks to African-American audiences how to be empowered. And they basically, they went from, I think, a thousand uh, views to a million views just last week. Wow. By sort of concentrating on the, on the content every day, really thinking it through, trying, testing. Ah, testing. Do some testing. None of, none of us know all the things. But, you know, see what works. Repeat those lessons, kind of rinse and repeat. So it's a process. So put it this way. We have a dedicated people who do social media, and that's, every, uh, that's everything that we do. That's the whole sole focus is social media. So if you want to get serious about social media or if you want to be serious in the social media, I would say allocate some serious resources. To it. All right. David, uh, anything to add about how we can better use social media and how we can better reach people where they are? Yeah, I mean, the, the questioner was, um, the, the way the question is framed is, you know, exactly right. You, you apply social media, you actually get in it, and there's immediate feedback. I mean, you're going to be able to see the engagement that you get. And so if you just pay attention to the data there that you're, you're looking at on your screen, it'll tell you if you're using it correctly or incorrectly. And I'll, I'll add to everything that Z was saying was absolutely right, but um, also, even if you put it, uh, if you put information out there and you put it in the wrong way or some wonky way that's dry and unappealing to uh, the vast majority of people, and that happens all the time. You want to do that, David? <laughs> well, not us. <laughs> not us. You know, I come from a communications background and I'll talk with my friends in the policy world and I'm very proud to work with them and they're awesome and they're really brilliant, but they'll get caught up on some, hey, well, this, this little nugget here. I mean, it, you know, the, we're not giving the full perspective and I, I'm like, that's not the point. The, the money cut is right here. You got to boil it down. But if you put it up there in an incorrect way, it doesn't mean that you're a failure because other people that are actually adept uh, or influencers on social media, they'll take that nugget of information if they're exposed to it and they'll repurpose it. You know, you're just not necessarily going to get credit for it. So, you know, you, you have to, you have to get the information out there. First of all, get involved with social media. The, the, the idea of using pictures and video, absolutely essential to uh, reaching more eyeballs. Um, but, you know, first and foremost, get it out there and, and be on it. 
and and then let other people take take over uh, who are better at it than you, if uh, if you're not the one making it, you know, uh, spread faster. Okay, Tracy, anything to add? Yeah, just that we scan for all these kind of great ideas and methods and strategies, grab them and then shoot them out to the rest of the network to have them customize and test and use. And then this way we can really speed up and accelerate our growth in, in social media and using tested messages to reach people where they're at. Yeah, we've certainly come a long way since the white paper days, right? And that was only 10-ish years ago. So uh, Grace, now you are the expert given your age. So give us the advice. What's the real answer? So the one thing that I noticed with social media as a young person is a lot of times when you're looking at organizations, you're going to look to see what their social media looks like. And so number one, you want to have it. And even if you don't think it's the best content, it's if your Twitter account only has 100 tweets, I'm going to be like, okay, this organization isn't really for my generation isn't really for my audience because they haven't been on here long enough. So get started so that you can build up that collection of data so that people can look at that. And then on top of that, utilize young people. There are a lot of people in college. I know a lot of times we think that college is just full of a bunch of leftist students. Um, but the reality is more, the, more often than not, that has to do with the faculty. And when you're paying thousands of dollars in tuition, you are going to write and do what your professors say to get an A or just pass. And so, uh, so many students actually are like silent conservatives and they would be more than happy to help you, whether that be an internship to help you get started doing your social media accounts. Um, just utilize those young people in so many different fields that are coming out, um, meet them at part, you can meet them at partisan events because more likely than not, a Republican event, they're probably going to be more conservative. And you can get those, utilize those young people and the skills that they know, because you can definitely tell when a, someone who's not really um, in tune with what's going on on social media or how to use it, you, there's a, there's little parts that you can notice. And so having those young people give them the information and the research and data that uh, Z and David were talking about and help them to craft that, but have young people actually utilizing it so right, that they can actually message correctly. That's, a, that's great advice. And most of our viewers aren't actually coming from organizations. They're donors to these causes. So guys, especially those of you who uh, may have been shaped by some of those world events that happened longer ago, reach out to your grandkids, right? Uh, to Grace's point, find those young people. I think that's, that's a great idea. And great advice. it will bring more people into the movement as a whole. Yeah. Uh, so that's great. Okay, great. Next question. Uh, and this is really interesting given, you know, the, the times we're living in from Kurt. When you're discussing liberty and, and, and trying to connect with young people on the ideas of liberty, are you also reaching out um, to explore this idea of justice? Are you guys engaged in that at all? Yes, I, I, I think to an extent, to an extent that we are, and I mentioned our uh, uh, our, our African-American outreach program, uh, Revolution of One, though they definitely deal with these issues and, and we were very fortunate to have this built out and given the current events. So they were able to approach the subject, I would say very authentically from a liberty perspective uh, mm -hmm. and give a real persuasive case about that. Once again, liberty and justice, they're not, they're, they're part of the same thing. The liberal system, when I say liberal, I mean classical liberal system, it is built on justice. It is built on the fact that everyone is equal. Everyone has the same sort of, uh, uh, every, the same rules apply to all of them. So I think, yes. Now, once again, we are foundation for economic education. So most of what we do, I think still 80% of what we do centers around economics, but we're deaf, so we, we're not uh, a justice institute, but we, we definitely not shy away mm -hmm. from the subject, especially once again, if we can make the case or persuade the people here about justice that wants a classical liberalism or liberty answers these questions. That makes sense. David, what about you being in Washington? Yeah, I mean, I, I would add, um, we focus on issues uh, from the same perspective. And I think that, you know, when you're talking about liberty, you're talking about property rights and, and equality under the law, the essential protections that, that people deserve. We talk about government transparency for everybody, for both sides. Um, we talk about school choice and whether or not it's fair to leave, uh, leave people in schools that are deemed by the state to be failing 
uh, for one graduating class after another. And I use the term graduating class loosely. Um, so we, we talk about those, those uh, issues in ways that, that reflect the unfairness and the injustice that it inflicts on uh, people. And in the case of uh, often in school choice, uh, that uh, disproportionately affects minorities and low income people. So um, we don't go, uh, we don't go out of our way to get involved in some of the other debates that are going on in Seattle on their terms, particularly on the open socialist terms um, or the progressive movement terms. But it, uh, but for the issues that we have, um, we talk about uh, about the the qualities that make them um, fair for everybody and uh, and essential for everybody and respect for everyone. That makes sense, Tracy. Anything to add? Yeah, I I think it's a great question that this network is uniquely well situated to address because we're closer to the action. We're better able because we're in each state and in localities able to reach out and build relationships and build more trust with different audiences and really come to understand uh, their concerns and how our policies, the alternatives, private voluntary alternatives could be a way out. So free markets do create that opportunity and this, this network is closer to that action. So that helps. You know, I'd like to add one thing, which is, um, you know, justice can be kind of a euphemism for speaking out um, for non-white audiences and other things. And, um, you know, again, just like when we were talking about young people, it's important to reach out and actually speak to non-traditional audiences for the free market message. You know, that's why we, we started uh, Washington Policy Center in Espanol page, you know, to put some of our essential work in Spanish on our page for our growing Spanish population in Washington State. Um, we have relationships with our ethnic chambers of commerce. So we're, we're reaching out to those audiences to make sure they hear the free market perspective and that, that the free market and these, the benefits of liberty are for everybody. You know, they're not limited to one group at all, not one age group, not one ethnic group, not one religious group, but for everybody. And I think that's really important for everybody. And when David had said earlier about the talk that they did on campus, he talked about how a lot of students hadn't been exposed to certain ideas. And talking to young people about the issues they care about brings them in the door. So you might bring them into the door talking about criminal justice issues because that's something young people across the political spectrum largely agree on. And then you can get into the fact of talking about, well, civil asset forfeiture is the government taking people's stuff without cause. And you can talk about these other things about how occupational licensing, hurts people and you can bring in those other nitty gritty like policy things that young people when if you're like oh come to my occupational licensing panel they're not going to do that but if you tie that into the ideas of justice and opportunity for everyone young people will listen very well said okay guys we are just about out of time and first thank you to everybody who's on the show today you guys this has been a great conversation we have had tons of questions come up all around K-12 education and getting this message in schools. There's a variety, those of you who haven't had your questions answered, they're all around K-12. We're actually having a special episode. I know we're doing this every other week now, but we're going to have a special episode around K-12 education next Wednesday at one o'clock because something big is happening in my home state of South Carolina and I want you guys to know about it. And so we will lean into your questions there. But just for fun, I thought we'd let Tracy go ahead and take one before we sign off because there were so many, I didn't want to ignore them. So Byron Lamb, thank you for joining the show again this week. Tracy, Byron wants to know if there's ways that the state-based think tanks can be a resource to what looks like a significant increase in homeschooling right now. Yes, and they are a resource. I think first in promoting homeschool as a viable alternative and being there to answer questions from families who are exploring it, helping them navigate any legal requirements, et cetera, in their state. A great example uh, is from one of our Utah think tanks, Libertas. Uh, they are doing some excellent work on this front. The, their CEO, Connor, hosted a very popular Facebook Live event a couple weeks ago uh, to, just to answer questions. And he was so overwhelmed, it was so popular, he ended up staying up almost all night answering questions from concerned parents, working through what their concerns were uh, to convert to homeschooling, to get their kids the education that they need now that some of the schools are closed down. Getting into communities and helping them work through the problems, 
that is what this network was created for. And, and homeschooling has, has just been one example of how the network is pivoting in a time of need to help solve problems on the ground in their state. And then finally, a third way is, is by just our usual advocating for policy solutions that help families overcome barriers to homeschool in general. And namely, things like getting a portion of their students' funding back uh, that they can put toward homeschooling expenses. So this is just a sampling of the network of, that's been an issue we've been fighting and working on for years. So yeah, it, it's a good thing, uh, Rebecca, that we're gonna do an extra episode on this. There's, a there's unprecedented opportunity, not to overuse the word unprecedented, but for sure, uh, a gap has opened up Parents are desperate for alternatives. This network has them. We want to help connect the two. All right. Thank you, Tracy. Hope to see you next week. And please, uh, I haven't said this before. It's a new thing. We want to open this show up. The, the more folks who view it, the better, I think. So please invite your friends for the invitation. We'd love to have uh, more folks come on that maybe haven't been exposed to this network and, and the ideas that you guys are, are bringing to fruition with your support. So thanks for joining us today and we'll hope to see you next week. Have a good one. Take Thank care. You.